thank you. Good morning. Um, and thanks for the invitation to speak here. <clears throat> so when one goes to conferences and workshops, um, I think one would expect that maybe the new results are the most, get the most attention. But actually, it turns out very often it's the old results that create the greatest excitement. Um, so here's a dialogue. So Claude says, uh, you have asked me these questions millions of times. And Ham responds, I love the old questions. And then, with an emphasis, are the old questions, the old answers. There's nothing like that. So my talk largely will be about the old questions and the old answers. So I hope you like it. <clears throat> okay. Um, the, the area I'd like to talk about is, uh, is an area uh, where there was a very influential dissertation and paper by Pfefferman. Uh, so his partly PhD thesis. Uh, then uh, what most of us know is this paper from 1960, the Resmitalization of Mathematics in a General Setting. And this is a, this, this is a very rich paper. Um, so it's concerned with the arithmetization of syntactic and uh, logical notions. And in particular, it emphasizes the two aspects of this enterprise. And I mean, it has extensional and intentional aspects. Um, well, to give you some examples, of extensional type are the, um, well, it's the first incomplete theorem, non-definability of truth and undecidability of various theories. Whereas intentional aspects uh, pop up in the second incompleteness theorem, and in particular also in Turing's ordinal logic, and that will be one big topic. Um, as you recall, in Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, it matters how you express consistency of a theory. <clears throat> okay. Um, Turing's ordinal logics, well, that's uh, a name he gave to what's now known as progressions of theories. Uh, he did this in his Princeton thesis. Um, okay, so the idea is, of course, from Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, and also from the first, we know that we have incompleteness, so we want to beef up the system. And one way is to add the consistency of the system. And then we can repeat. And okay, how do you describe these um, iterations? Well, we want to iterate actually not only finitely many times, but uh, transfinitely many times. And so you need to express this in the, in the framework of arithmetic. Uh, you'll need to talk about orderings. And okay, these orderings are given by the church cleaning system of uh, notations for recursive ordinals. And then you can iterate uh, certain operations along a uh, path in cleaning's O. Okay. So you start with some base theory T0, uh, T, so T is the base theory, and then T0 is the first. And then at successor stages, you just add the consistency of the previous theory, and at limit stages, you kind of gather together all the previous theories. Okay, and then uh, there is Turing's completeness result, which says that if we have uh, a true pi zero one statement. Well, then we can actually prove it um, in one of these theories. And um, so, what happens is you can actually, so given this sentence f, you can construct a notation for a, a recursive ordinal a sub f in O. Uh, and such that, at, and then you get, okay, then you get this hierarchy of theories, 
such that at that level of AF, you get the provability of F in the theory, T sub AF. Yeah? And so here, OK, what, what is the hierarchy you, one uses here? OK, one could start, for instance, with PA. Yeah? So let's say we start with PA. And then also, OK, these are notations for ordinals. You might wonder, OK, what's the order time? Um, it turns out that really you get uh, the order time is not very high of this notation AF, it's just omega plus one. So basically, you have to go to the limit stage and one more. And then you can prove it. Okay, so on the face of it, it looks like an amazing theorem. And since I stressed the two aspects, highlighted in Feynman's work, the intentional and the intentional. This is highly intentional, and I will, therefore, I'd like to give you the proof yeah, to show what's going on. OK. Progression of theories. Um, so Turing, okay, Turing proved that if you have a pi 0, 1 sentence, then you can eventually prove it in one of these progressions. And then the obvious question is, um, how about uh, sentences of higher complexity. At the time, actually, Turing was interested in the Riemann hypothesis. And at that time, people knew that it has a pi 0 2 uh, version, not yet that it has a pi 0 1 version. So Turing was interested in pi 0 2 statements. Okay, and uh, right, so um, the idea then was as well, we have to beef up what we do at success this stage. It's not just any con, but maybe more, yeah? Something stronger, okay. And then uh, an obvious idea is that you add something like the local reflection principle, or what is now called the local reflection principle, which is a schema. So R of n t is, what you add is, if you can prove f, then f. So you add these, um, these implications for all sentences f. And uh, so Turing surmised that yeah, maybe if, if in the progression, instead of just doing the con, we do the, the local reflection principle, we will be able to prove all pi 0 or 2 statements. But it turned out it's not the case. And you can actually easily show that if you do progressions based on local reflection and start with PA, uh, then, however far you iterate this stuff, uh, it will be a subtheory of PA plus all two pi zero one sentences. So uh, you cannot show that that you get uh, all two pi zero two segments provable in somewhere in this progression. Okay, so uh, that's not enough. So the local reflection principle is not enough, and then. Uh, um, a stronger reflection principle was used in Pfefferman's uh, paper from 1962, Transfinite Recursive Progressions of Axiomatic Theories. And there he actually managed to show that there are certain progressions so that you can prove any arithmetic, true arithmetic statement in the progression. Okay, and this idea, uh, uh, what you have to do, well, is somehow related to the omega rule. Uh, uh, if you look back at the history, so people were considering not only <coughs> finite proofs, but actually also infinite proofs. You might know that Brahma did not really like formal proofs. Uh, so that infinite proofs might be the right proofs, was something that was somewhat vaguely stated by Brauer and Samero. So um, Hilbert, in this paper, in a paper from 19, which was submitted in 1930 and appeared in 1931, the Grundlegung der Elementaren Zahlenlehre, he used an infinite rule. So I have written the, um, okay, so this is the, here uh, we have the two sided sequence calculus, so you have a, a right and a, a left omega rule. Okay. And uh, so Hilbert suggested this only for f being a, a decidable thing. Yeah. So in this way, you use the omega rule to deduce pi zero one statements. 
Uh, what's amazing about this thing is that, um, that actually this is before the, the incompleteness results, right? So it was submitted this in 1930 and then appeared in early 31, so it's before the incompleteness result. And it's, I think it's the first uh, place where you find this in the literature, this kind of rule, though in a, in a restricted form. Okay. And then uh, the general uh, omega rule uh, was used um, to great effect and in proof theory. So, for instance, Schütte in uh, his Beweis theoretische Fassung der unendlichen Induktion in der Zahlentheorie von, so this is from 51, was submitted 49. And also Lorenzen in his paper Algebraische und Logistische Untersuchung über freie Verbände. Uh, this, they employed calculi with the omega rule. And should they immediately use ordinals to measure the lengths and um, complexity of such derivations? Um, ordinals will not show up in Lorentzian's work. Okay, so the omega rule. And uh, so the, the, the stronger version of reflection is uh, informed by this rule. Uh, so this is called the uniform reflection principle. This is the schema that if for all x you can prove in t f of the girdle number of f of x dot, this is the dot notation that Featherman used in his paper. So dot x means, well, if you have, so internally if you have an, an arbitrary number x, you can create a formal object, namely the numeral that corresponds to x, the x numeral, and that's what is, what is meant here. Okay? And so you, you see you have something like um, it doesn't, it has another word which is more um, akin to the, uh, to the omega rule, yeah, but it's equivalent to this one here. Okay. And then, um, as I said, so Pfefferman got this uh, amazing result that, um, um, that actually you can get every true arithmetical statement provable in uh, this hierarchy, this progression of theories, where you do the, the, uh, what's called the uniform reflection principle at successive stages. And uh, you can actually get it uh, already at some pretty low stage. So these uh, notations are notations for ordinals um, less than this guy here. And OK, so that's quite amazing. And sometimes it's an amazing theorem. And okay, so personally, um, this for me was a little bit like a, you know, like a blind spot. And the reason was, so if you, if you read the proof, uh, the proof is very entangled, very self-referential. It makes very complicated self-referential things. And when I tried to understand it, I got some kind of seasick. Uh, and I thought this was always some kind of frustration about this proof. And um, for, for, the for some kind of Turing point, I was asked whether I would like to write a paper on progression. And at first um, I said yes, and then I said no, because but I, I wanted to have a proof of this theorem, which I couldn't understand. And uh, okay, now I think there is a proof of that. Okay. Uh, just to briefly uh, recall Cleaney's O, so um, that's, that's an inductive definition. So Cleaney uses for, so there's a successor of something, it's just, it's just a good number, uh, it's just a number 2 to the A, and for limits he uses this notation here, it doesn't really matter. And then we have an ordering on, on O. So it's an inductive definition, you see. Uh, this comes out in particular in clause 3, so if E is an index of a total recursive function and we have that E of n is always defined and E of n lands in O and we have this kind of, and it, it yields an increasing sequence, well then we create a new object in O lim, just called lim E and yeah, and that's it. That's the inductive definition. Okay, and now um, proof, I, I'd like to give you a uh, very briefly, the proof of Turing's completeness result. So it says that if you have a true by zero one statement, then you can prove it in the progressions based on consistency. Okay, so let's pick a by zero one statement. Um, theta. 
So the Pythagoras said, we do not know whether it's true or not. Uh, so psi is primitive recursive, and then you can define uh, um, a Turing machine with program E such that, but E of n, what is that? It's the, the nth successor of the zero in O, denoted by n sub O, if up to that point, these statements psi k are all true. Yeah? So that's a primitive recursive thing, psi is all decidable. And otherwise, um, otherwise you just say e of n is suck of lemma e. And so that such a thing exists, it follows from the recursive theory. OK, great. And now, uh, now I assume that, well, now I assume that theta is true, so the statement is true, and then definitely e of n is always n sub o for all n. And as a consequence, lim e belongs to O, and lim e has, yeah, order type omega. All right, that's fine. Uh, and now, what I claim is that the consistency of the system T, lim e, entails that um, theta is true. Well, how is that? So here we, we just assume now the consistency of T and E, right? And I would like to show you that theta is true. For if, if theta were false, we would have a uh, counterexample, not psi n for some n. And thus, by, by definition of these theories, T of E of n would be T sub E for all n not smaller than n, yeah, by definition. Yeah. And, but by design, so if this so the hierarchy is based on adding consistency of successor stages. Uh, therefore, T sub lim e proves the consistency of T lim e. And T e n is always a sub-theory of T lim e for all n. OK. And thus, it turns out that if that's the case. If T of e n is the same as T sub lim e for sufficiently large n, then T lim e would prove its own consistency, rendering it inconsistent. OK, and so that's a contradiction to the consistency. And therefore, theta must be true. And the foregoing argument can be carried out in PA. Yeah. And a and, fortiori, and uh, since PA is a subtitle <coughs> of T sub e, um, we know now that T sub e proves theta. And in particular, it's not so important um, to know to look at all the details. The thing is, when you see the proof, you know the whole thing is, is cheap. Yeah. You, so you think uh, the idea of a progression would be that gradually you get smarter. You know, gather more knowledge, you can prove more things. And finally, at the level of omega plus one, you, you, get, you prove the truth of the population. But this, this is all a mirage. It's, it's really kind of cooked up. The notation is cooked up to, to, to do the job. Yeah. OK, so epistemologically, that's, nothing is happening here. You don't gain any new insights. Anyway, some results were great on the outside, but not so on the inside. Uh, OK, now, Hefferman's result is, gives the, so that shows that you can get the truth of every arithmetic statement in the stronger progressions. Uh, and I said that yeah, the, the proof is, is very indirect, very, um, very involved with applications, several applications of the recursion theorem. OK, uh, so the Pfefferman's talk of Francine, for instance, in his book, he looked at this, and then there was also a paper in the BSL where he looked again at these transfinite progressions, a second look at completeness in the BSL. Um, so he gives kind of the story and, uh, of, the, of this result and so on. But in essence, this paper doesn't give you a new proof. He actually he kind of um, looks at the pi zero two case and simplifies it a little bit. But essentially, it's the same thing. It's, it's really based on the on clever um, employments of the recursion theorem. And um, I kind of like his title, a second look back. I was kind of tempted to, call my, uh, to name my talk the third look, 
<laughs> so this is a third log actually. Uh, so um, okay, so the goal is to find another proof which might be for some people more transparent. And uh, okay, so let, let's look. Let's briefly look into the details of Pfefferman's. Not not into the details, but let's say the ingredients that he uses for the proof. Okay, and the ingredients. One of the ingredients is he um, uses a result that's usually attributed to Schoenfeld on a restricted omega loop. So if you have omega proofs, then in the system you can deduce, that's easy, just to show that in omega logic, it's easy to deduce every true arithmetical statement. And then a natural question is, well, so I have these infinite proofs. If I require these infinite proofs to be more computational, say one, one requirement could be, well, let's say I, I want the infinite proofs to be recursive, or I want the infinite proofs to be primitive recursive. Uh, is it then still true that we can prove all um, true arithmetic statements? And that was one of the questions. And uh, so Schoenfeld's completeness theorem asserts that, yeah, it, it suffices to use um, uh, recursive proof trees. Uh, and, but actually, it turns out that it was proved earlier by Schütter, this result. And even in a, so uh, Gérard Sautron, he did, um, I think, some kind of master thesis project under Dunlop at, at Oxford University, where he, where he kind of gathered all the information about the Omega rule. Very, it's a very, a very useful source if you want to know this, the history of the Omega rule and all these things. But, and he basically he turned every stone. So if you if you look for historical information about this, you'll find it there. But strangely, he, he doesn't mention this paper from um, which from 19, which appeared in 1956. And in this paper, there is this result. Uh, namely, Schütte introduces the concept of a Stammbaum of a formula, so a search tree for a formula also known as a canonical tree of a formula. And uh, it basically follows from his Satz Z that uh, you get completeness uh, for not only for uh, recursive omega proofs, but actually for primitive recursive omega proofs, or even elementary recursive omega proofs. And uh, OK. And in particular, from, from this, you can also um, draw a corollary, namely for every arithmetic sentence C, well, you have, this, you have this kind of canonical tree, it's canonical tree B sub C, um, then you can look at the creamy brawler ordering on this tree. It's a tree of sequences here, a formula. So, it's a, so look at the creamy brawler ordering. And then what you can do is you can um, you can find an arithmetic formula such that provably in PA, C is equivalent to the transfinite induction along the cleaning brother ordering with respect to A. So here you see you can every formula can be is equivalent to a formula of this form, of some kind of transfinite induction. And then if you if you can properly talk about well-foundedness in like an ACA zero, then you have that this is a well-ordering if and only if C holds. Um, this was also a similar, a similar thing was also observed in the Schoenfield um, in the paper actually which appeared the same year by Kaiser, Schoenfield and Wang. Uh, they also observed this that um, for every arithmetic sentence C one can construct a primitive recursive ordering and so on and so on. So the same thing. And um, yeah, and so why, why do I mention this result, uh, the completeness theorem? Well, this is what Pfefferman uses in his proof. It's one of the central ingredients. Okay. Now, just uh, these kind of Stammbaum or canonical search trees. Um, let me just give you a, a, a brief glimpse at this. Um, it's what I think everybody knows. It's basically it means that if you're given a formula and then you want to deduce it. And basically, you apply the, the rules of omega logic backwards. That's it, in a systematic way. Um, but just look at this for a moment. OK, so here we, so we start with a 
with a C, which is um, which is not atomic. For simplicity here, I use a sequence calculus where everything is in normal form, in a negation normal form, and uh, just the one-sided version of it. So in this sequence calculus, one deduces sequence, and um, so one starts with a non-atomic thing, C. So the first, uh, so gamma zero being C just means, of course, the usual thing that we, it means it's the sequence consisting of this single formula, but we leave out the curly brackets. Okay, and and then uh, so gamma zero is just consists of C, and then for the uh, for the sequence gamma i, where i is less than k, they should be non-axiomatic. So a, a, such a sequence is a bunch of finite formulas. It's called axiomatic. It have if it has a true, if it contains a true literal. And this, this is decided because we have, it's just a primitive recursive thing. So we see that, it's, uh, gamma, that these are non-axiomatic. And, um, and then they can be written in such a form. So basically, on the left-hand side, you, you put all the stuff that, that consists of literals. And then you get to the to a first formula, which is not a literal. And then some stuff after that. So I kind of divide up the, the whole sequence here in this way. And then E is called the redex. And then according to how the redex looks like. Uh, uh, I thought you said that uh, part two uh, being, uh, being axiomatic means contains, I thought it couldn't contain any literals. Now you're saying in three, the beginning part, it does contain only literals. Okay, so uh, yeah. I, so by, uh, so th this this is a notation for the whole sequent uh, gamma i. Yeah? So, yeah. So this is gamma i, and it's, it's a bunch of formulas that are listed in a certain way. And I, I first list all the literals. So this might be empty, as this could could be empty. This could be empty here. Yeah. I first list all the literals, and then uh, I I hit upon. Um, uh, the first thing that can be reduced. That's all. Uh, but I thought but number two uh, means that gamma i doesn't contain all the any literals. No, no. True. True. It's not axiomatic. It can contain literals. It could be just be false. Yeah. False literals. Oh. It's, it's, it's axiomatic if there's a true literal. Yeah. Oh. Okay. okay. Yep. So if you divide up, and so you say, okay, if I have a bunch of formulas, I find the first formula I can work on. That's, that's called the index E. And then according to the, so now we would like to say, how do we get from gamma i to gamma i, to so gamma sub i plus one, yeah? And you do it according to what the redex looks like, and you do it as follows. So if, if the redex is a disjunction, you do this, you take it apart and list both components. Uh, if you have a conjunction, well, then you have a choice which one you take can take one of the conjuncts to create gamma sub i plus one. If you have an existential, if there's an existential statement, well then you, um, what you do is you, uh, so you look at the first possible uh, witness, so the first number m, such that uh, the formula f of the m bar means, <coughs> m bar is the m's literal, uh, the m's nonsense, is the m's, m's numeral, okay. And so you take the first candidate, which does not occur before in the previous things, and then you add it at the end again. You have to do it because you have to, it has to be processed again and again and again as you go on. So OK, this is the usual stuff for uh, if you have a universal um, statement, then you have a choice here. You can take any of them, and so on. But the main thing, why did I write it down? Well, you see that producing these uh, um, deduction Chains is an elementary operation. Okay. So you make your decision based on just inspecting the formulas and then you take them apart. And so on. Okay, so you see, and then all of these deduction uh, chains give me the, um, the Schlumbaum, the canonical tree associated with C. Yeah. And you see that the tree is going to be, this, this object is going to be elementary. Okay, so that's, that's just. Um, 
Yeah, this is what I just said. The, the C deduction chains form a tree, and this is okay. And then there's two possible outcomes. If you took, like I just started with an arithmetic state. Let's see, there's two possible outcomes. The one outcome is that the tree is well founded. Well, and then I have an, uh, then I have a proof in omega logic, yeah? And the proof is also as primitive recursive or elementary recursive. That's one thing. And the other possible outcome is, I use, I use classical logic, is it's not well founded, yeah? Okay, if it's not well founded, then basically you have an infinite path. And then the infinite path can be used to show that C is false. End of story. Okay, that's it. All right. And now, uh, the idea for proving um, performance completeness theorem, so that when I base the progressions on uniform reflection, then I will eventually be able to prove any true arithmetic statement, yes? And so, okay, so we take C, any arithmetic sentence, and we look at the Kleene Brauer ordering on its canonical tree. Okay. And now I, I do not use O, instead I use the um, Kleene Brauer ordering on the canonical tree. And, uh, okay, and then I can define a progression in this way uh, along the Kleene Brauer ordering. I say T sigma is. PA plus the previous levels plus the uniform reflection principle for, for the union of the previous levels. Okay? So this is the definition here. And then it turns out there's a close connection now between what you can prove in T sigma and what happens in and what happens in the canonical tree at this stage, sigma. Okay, so this just uh, explains what t less than sigma means. It's just, you kind of collect all the previous ones. Okay, and so here's the theorem. The theorem is that if in the canonical tree, at stage sigma, we have the sequent, and now, unfortunately, I'm only switching between the two-sided and the one-sided. The one-sided has the advantage that, it's, that you can be lazy. You don't have to look at too many cases because if there's a two-sided signal kind, you always have to look at the left side and the right side. Okay, but morally, and you should always use the two-sided signal calculus. Okay, now I'm using the two-sided signal calculus. Okay, um, right. So what happens is in the canonical tree, if at the, the lower sigma we have the what we find there is this sequence gamma arrow delta, uh, then it can actually be proved in T sigma in the, in the associated theory at this level where the iterations are done by uniform reflection. And now here you see a clear, a clear connection now between these progressions and, um, and the, the canonical proof tree, the search tree. And that explains why, I think it explains why how Pfefferman's result actually is obtained. Okay. And, okay, so, um, this theorem, you need a technical, you need a technical tool, which is very cute. Uh, and this, this tool has been used many, many times by many people. And the tool is due to, um, well, Schmel, it's called reflexive induction. Uh, and that, uh, I think, for the first time, maybe it appeared earlier. Yeah. At least it comes up in this paper here from 1978. And, okay, the formula is called uh, reflectively progressive with respect to the theory T. Uh, if the following can be deduced, namely T, you can deduce that for all x, if you if you have that for all predecessors of x, with, so this, this relation, this um, ordering relation, let's assume it's primitive recursive, yeah. If you have a primitive recursive relation here, and now... One of those in parentheses is missing. 
as a first grade poem. That's right. That's why my Turk, man, when I compiled, was complaining. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, <clears throat> so this one is missing. Yes, should be one. If that confuses you. Yeah. Okay. So it means that uh, when we when we have for all y less than x, we can prove f of dot y uh, that uh, yields f of x. So if that's the case, uh, if that's the case, it's called reflectively progressive. Uh, such a formula is called reflectively progressive. And then it turns out that the theorem that uh, Wolf Schmel proved is if fu is reflectively progressive with respect to t, then actually t proves for all x, f of x. Okay? And, and this, this tool is used uh, to, to prove this result. Okay. And here's the proof of this um, nice thing, um, reflexive induction. So we want to prove it. So we're assuming that uh, we have um, reflective progressiveness. So this is this here. OK. And then uh, what you get then, if you have the premise uh, that uh, it's provable for all x f of x, well, then it's certainly provable for all x. Uh, it's provable that for all y less than x dot, f y dot. This is a mistake. There shouldn't be a dot. No. There shouldn't be a dot. This dot is wrong here. OK, you erase that. OK. Right. So this is just um, basically a specialization. Yeah? If you have it for all x, well, then you have it for those guys y that, that happen to be less than x dot. That's obvious. Uh, <clears throat> OK, but then the next line, we use the fact that from this, because of reflective progressiveness, uh, we get fx in each case. So we have for all x, fx. So in total, we have provable for all x, fx, and entails for all x, fx. And then now comes the magic of Loeb's theorem. It tells you, OK, then, for all x, fx is provable. That's it. Very easy. Though uh, it's not easy conceptually. I mean, it's, if one writes it down, if you want to get your head around it, it's uh, not so easy. OK, so then, uh, so this uh, is, the ma is one of the tools. And then you get this result. And I think this, this can explain, to some extent, what I do, uh, why we have this phenomenon that every um, true arithmetic statement is provable in these progressions based on uniform reflection. Because it's very much tied to the canonical proof tree. And then we have this connection. And, Okay, so this was mainly uh, looking back, the old questions, the old answers. Uh, well, as Professor Schwichenberg said, um, the search tree has a, have a very, um, can be used in many, many circumstances. So I would like to, I think I, yeah, I have some there. When, I'm, when, I'm, when I am, I am supposed to stop actually. Is there an official? 45? Okay. Great, five minutes. Um, this is a slightly different topic now, um, but it uses these search trees, among other things. Um, and so in this project, one aims to. Um, look at statements about preservation of well orderings from the point of view, say, of reverse mathematics. And so what I mean by such statements is the following. Um, so if x is a well order, is, is a well ordering, then f of x is a well ordering. Okay, so we have some kind of operation on well orderings. So in particular, you can imagine that um, well, we have many well orderings in proof theory, for instance, um, how we build epsilon zero, how we build gamma zero, and how we build Bachmann, Howard, Ordinal. And, and these are actually uh, these are primitive recursive, elementary recursive, very low recursive well ordering, if you just look at the, at the description of them. And now we can relativize this. Maybe you have already a well ordering. 
And then you would like to construct another well ordering out of it, yeah. Uh, where you maybe put at the bottom, you put this x, and then you do the same construction that you do for epsilon zero, yeah, or some other things. So basically, I'm, I'm interested here in effective um, operations on um, presentations of well orderings, yeah. And there's lots of them, and um, so such a statement, let's call it WAP F, if F is, gives you such a transformation, it, um, it, it transforms the well ordering into another well ordering. Okay, and uh, so for instance, uh, you could have a well ordering X, say, and then you want like to construct the well ordering which corresponds to two to the X, so which would, in other words, if, you have, if the order type of X is alpha, and the order type of two to the X would be two to the alpha of the ordinals, yeah, such things. And so there are some results. So Girard showed that over RCA0, the following equivalent arithmetic comprehension, and the statement that um, <coughs> the operation which goes from x to 2 to the x preserves well all of this. OK. And uh, 2 to the x is effectively computable from x. Mm. And so here we have, so we have something, here we have a, a comprehension principle, whereas here we have a concrete operation and going from x to 2 to the x, but we preserve a certain abstract property, wealth of things. Okay, and this uh, theme has then been extended. Um, so, uh, for instance, there's another characterization from the theory ACA0+, uh, which is another somewhat canonical system in reverse mathematics. And what you do is you can, so this theory tells you that you can iterate the jump omega many times. Yeah. And uh, this theory is interesting because some famous or some important combinatorial results are provable at this level. The Heinemann, uh, so Heinemann's theorem and, and the Osler and the Ellis theorem, for instance. One doesn't know yet uh, whether. Um, it's not known whether the theorems can already be proved in ACA0. Okay, and then the, the, the operation on orderings which, which characterizes by a rock principle, AC0 plus, is going from an ordering to its to epsilon x. Yeah, epsilon x, and this was proved in different ways. It was proved uh, by recursion theory and it was proved by proof theory. So the two x equivalents, so AC0 plus and for all x, rho x, then rho epsilon x. And just to, give, uh, to show you what I mean by this going from x to epsilon x, so you basically, um, so you create a represent, so you, give, you have the x is given, and now you would like to create uh, epsilon x, and how do you do it? So basically, the elements of the given well ordering x here, for each u in x, you create uh, a new notation, epsilon u, which is going to, Behave like an epsilon number in the <coughs> representation system, epsilon x. Yeah. And then you do the usual thing with Cantor normal form and so on. So it's an effective operation. Uh, so the steps you do it is just elementary, recursive steps. Okay, and then of course you have to define everything. And it's a bit, uh, okay, the same, similar thing can be done with the phi function. And then you get. Um, uh, you get this ATL zero is equivalent to preservation of uh, if you go from the well ordering x to the well ordering phi x zero. Uh, this proof uh, uh, Friedman I think is unpublished and does a proof by Andreas and myself. And okay, I do not have much time, so I don't want to go into this. And uh, and then you can go on. Another um, interesting operation is. Uh, associated with the gamma function. So given the well ordering x, you can construct a gamma x, a new well ordering, and this, this preserves, uh, this operation preserves uh, well orderings, but that turns out to be equivalent to the statement that uh, every set is contained in an omega model of ATR. Yeah. And this theme has been extended. Uh, you can apply it to the Bachmann Howard. Construction, and if you do it to the, to the Bachmann Howard construction, uh, then the preservation is equivalent to the statement that every set is contained 
in a countable coded omega model of bow induction. And finally, uh, we have a result here about um, omega models of pi on one CA. So here you have to uh, do this construction here. You go from a well operating X, you go to, uh, okay, so if, if one knows the order analysis of pi on one CA, uh, it has these big animals, uh, omega one, omega two, and so on, and, that the, and then the limit of those, big omega, so little omega, and so you can create this and um, get this result. Um, okay, that's basically the end. I just wanted to say, um, so in the proofs, the search trees play a role, yeah? But it's not all, it's not like that this would be a sausage machine where you put in the meat and then the sausage comes out automatically. Actually, uh, the proofs are, this proof in particular, uh, has cost me one month of my life. So it's, um, <laughs> uh, so uh, together with this, uh, with uh, Alec Thomas. So, his life. So? In his life, maybe. It has cost him 40 years of his life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>